Today I have the distinct privilege to talk with Curtis Schweitzer, one of the composers for the yet-to-be-released Halo Infinite. Curtis talked about being a composer, what it's like to work in games, and gets into some awesome details about Halo music. You won't want to miss it. The first videos on this channel were breakdowns of what was at the time the only look at Infinite proper that had been released, which came in the form of a trailer called Discover Hope from 2019. Innocent Times. That trailer was scored by the wonderful Curtis Schweitzer. As luck would have it, sometime after posting those, Curtis actually found and shared my videos out. His support was very kind and got me a lot of additional viewership. A few weeks ago, I reached out to him to ask if he'd be interested in going deeper and responding to some of my observations and do a bit of an interview. And to my great delight, he agreed. So today, I have a very exciting set of responses by Curtis to my handful of questions, which I submitted asynchronously, in other words, not live, which I did to give us both a chance to think through what we had to say, and uh, mostly because I've never done a live interview. So let me know what you think, and if you enjoyed, do subscribe, because there's a good chance we'll do this again, and hopefully I can bring forward the words of other contributors to the Halo musical family. Without further ado, let's get into it. Hi, Curtis. First off, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on. Uh, I'd also like to reiterate my thanks for you sharing my video on Discover Hope. That was super helpful and very cool for me. So to start off, could you talk about your formal education in music? What instruments did you study on formally? And also, what all do you play? Well, thanks for having me on. I guess I'll uh, just get right into it. Um, I have a bachelor's of music in theory and composition. Uh, as far as instruments are concerned, uh, my primary instrument is piano. Um, I have played other instruments, and I suppose that the instruction I've received could be called formal, um, but mostly it was sort of short stints um, learning at a very, very beginner level to sort of get the experience of what orchestral players go through when they're playing an instrument um, to sort of understand the basic mechanics of it. I've done that for all the instrument families, strings, winds, brass, uh, and percussion. The next thing I'd like to ask about is your compositional process. I've seen your videos on your YouTube channel where you've uploaded your practice sessions composing. So when you sit down to write, do you have a preferred method? Also, do you recommend staff pad? So I guess first of all, I would definitely recommend Staff Pad if you are the sort of person who likes to write your music down on paper. And I'm one of those people, that's sort of how I, how I learned, was that I was always, when I first began composing, the ultimate goal was to not to produce a sound file, it was to produce a readable score that could be performed. Um, and so a lot of my early process when I was first starting out composition back in high school, well, maybe middle school, high school, somewhere in there, was to actually sit down and write down the music that I was trying to compose um, and work on it from there. Uh, my real formative years of composing were done in um, engraving programs like Sibelius or Finale. And so it's a lot easier for me to conceive of a piece structurally, um, both in terms of like sort of the large scale structure of the entire piece of music, but also even small scale structures like melodies when I'm writing something down. And the thing that Staff Pad helps me with in terms of those aspects of composition is it allows me to do that, but also use these like really high quality samples that you used to not really get in sort of the write down music, engrave music space, if you will. And so just the ability to combine those two things has really revolutionized my workflow. Having said that, I often work in a DAW, just like a lot of other media composers, where it's basically sit down, improvise something into a virtual instrument, and then do it all with sort of MIDI keyboard programming, um, <clears throat> which um, is also an interesting way to write music. It's, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I feel as proficient at it as I do like working in something like a, like a Dorico or a Sibelius, um, but it does give you that sort of immediate gratification of, oh, I can now hear this 
And if you know, you're using a high quality sample that's actual instruments being recorded, you're hearing something that's pretty close to what it would sound like if you were to just hand it to uh, you know, a cello section, say, uh, right now. Um, so it kind of just depends. You know, media composition is usually not as much about producing a readable score as it is producing a MIDI demo, a MIDI mock-up that faithfully represents what would happen if you took the music into a live setting and actually recorded it, or it's to try to produce something that, you know, fakes the listener into thinking that you did just that, right? So the end goals of both these processes are pretty different. At the end of one, you get a really nice, beautiful printed piece of music. And on the other, you get, you know, a wave file uh, that sounds like you want it to. And so I use both processes and it just kind of depends on what, what I'm looking for in the end goal. And, you know, when you're working on something like a game, you're looking to, you know, produce a file that you can send to people and that they can hear something that's pretty close to what they're going to get if they decide to go record it because that's how they make their decisions, right? Like you can't expect people who are non-musicians to look at a score and be like, oh yeah, this will be a great cue. Um, of course they aren't going to be able to do that. That's not any more than I can look at computer code and be like, oh, this is going to be a great game. That's not my job. My job is to produce realistic, good mock-ups that we can use to kind of move forward. You know, it also really helps the feedback process because you can get a lot more people from a lot more disciplines to get you good feedback um, when you're giving them actual audio. And that results in, you know, a lot more revisions and a lot more chances to sort of polish everything down and make things sound as good as they can. In the Halo Waypoint interview you did, you implied that you don't do your own orchestration or didn't for Halo Infinite. Of course, you're able to orchestrate your own music as you can see on your YouTube channel and the indie projects you've done where you're the only composer like Starbound. Uh, So is that just a result of you and the other composers having so much music to write for this big of a game in the time frame? Or is that just pretty common in bigger games? Also, I'd be curious to know who's doing the orchestration if you can talk about that. Sure. Our orchestrator was uh, Tim Davies. You can go to his website at timmusic.net. The first time I went there, knowing that he was working with us, it was a pretty humbling experience to see his quite vast um, resume in terms of projects that he's worked on. You've definitely seen or heard something that he's orchestrated or conducted or even composed. He's also a composer. Um, Orchestration in media is kind of this very broad discipline. It goes beyond what maybe concert classical people think of as orchestration we you know i came from a more concerty classical background in terms of writing music down on paper before halo and so i thought of orchestration as being choosing that a bassoon's gonna play this line or we're gonna voice this string chord this way in reality your job is kind of to take a listen to the midi mock-up that the composer has worked on and probably been through many revisions of understand that that is what has been approved and to produce a written score that would faithfully recreate that in a session when you go to record it with live players. And so that involves a lot of different skills, the ability to sort of hear the sample and know, well, you know, that's really quiet. Maybe we should, we should mute it. Uh, maybe it's looking at a chord and going, yeah, that sounds great with a sample, but, you know, I think we could use some brass reinforcement, say, uh, here. Or to know that you might want to change something a little bit uh, about a particular passage of music, and so you write, say, a a little cue part above it that is sort of an optional line to record while you're there in the session to see if maybe that would get you a little closer to the thing that you're trying for with this with the imperfect samples and of course recording is not cheap it's very expensive thing to do so having the simple sanity check that especially say tim's experience brings to the project is very very reassuring for everybody and helps you to make sure that all your ducks are in a row before you go into the session so that you're not wasting time while you're there trying to figure out orchestration problems or chord voicing issues or anything like that. All of which is to say, 
it is very common to have orchestrators on very big AAA games, big movies, any sort of thing where the recording sessions are going to be very expensive, very time consuming, and you want to just make sure that you've got everything exactly right before you end up there so that you're not wasting time and money. So I'm curious what the workflow of working with two other composers is like. Do you designate roles? Do you each specialize in writing for certain instruments or like one of you establishes the core themes? Or do you distribute the game up three ways? Does the music supervisor, Joel Yarger, coordinate that? How does that work? Yeah, that's, uh, that's really Joel's role is to coordinate us and make sure that we're all on the same page, stylistically, musically, thematically, all that stuff. Um, and he does a really great job of it. He does an amazing job of it. We are very well taken care of by uh, by 343 and it's certainly very nice when you're just one part of a really big hole to have that sort of really competent management so that you know exactly what your job is and how it fits in with everyone else's. So you also mentioned in your Halo Waypoint interview having had a lot of experience with the series over the years. So when you got this gig, how did you approach studying the music more deeply in preparation, having already known the music? Are there any specific methods you used, like large-scale transcription? Or did you just replay the games a lot and write to what you thought felt good? I'm just curious because studying Halo music is what I do on this channel. I study a lot of other music too, but I'm curious if there's any specific ways you got in touch with the coveted Halo sound, so to speak. I think I'm kind of fortunate in that my compositional style, I think probably because it is influenced by Halo, because I played so much back in the day, that it's pretty compatible with sort of the approach that uh, Marty and Mike did in the first games. And in that sense, I didn't feel like I really needed to do a lot of study to necessarily capture that. I felt like I kind of already had that on lock and key, you know, make sure everything's in Dorian mode, use the right instruments, all that stuff. But also, you know, I would go back frequently while we were working on something to listen to a cue from one of the earlier Halos that matched up with what we were trying to do. Uh, certainly if we were referencing specifically a particular piece of music, I would pay a lot of attention and go back and listen to those. And of course, I still play Halo for fun. So in terms of being immersed in the music, that's also kind of an ongoing process. Ultimately, I'm a pretty intuitive composer, and I rewrite a lot. So much of the process is just writing something, listening to it back, and kind of just saying, does this feel like Halo to me? And if it doesn't, write it again. And the next thing I'm curious about is a pretty brief question. Do you get to be involved with the recording sessions? And for that matter, any of the post-production work? Absolutely. Uh, all the composers got to be present uh, at the recording sessions. In uh, 2020, sometimes that means something a little bit different than it has in years past. But yeah, we're definitely involved and we definitely have feedback and we're right there on mic, uh, able to give notes to the players and all that stuff. And in terms of uh, post-production, yeah, we, we've I've sat down and played parts of the game to see how the music plays back. I get to have some feedback on that. I obviously get feedback on the mixing and mastering and all that post-production audio stuff that gets done. Um, which, by the way, I will take your brief question and take a moment to just ramble on about how great the 343 audio team is in total. Uh, we've had so much support from them and they've done so much work in terms of making something that we wrote as composers sound really, really great, and uh, I will be forever grateful for that. Okay, more specific question. I noticed that a lot of the returning material in Discover Hope, like the old melodies and things, are more or less the same, except the key is different. Is there any significant reason that you had a lot of that in F minor, as opposed to the E minor that most of that music was in before? Like, for instance, I noticed that the shield recharge sound uh, hums it like a C, and so that's the fifth of F minor, whereas that wouldn't really uh, sound as resonant uh, against E minor. So did it have to do with interacting with the sound design, or did you even know what the sound effects were going to sound like? You know, it's interesting you bring up that shield recharge sound. I've never noticed that. Um, I worked on 
versions of the trailer that were pretty old compared to, you know, the final thing that you end up seeing, because obviously everybody's working on all parts of it all at once. I don't think that I knew that that Shield Recharge sound was going to be in there. For all I know, and this is complete speculation on my part, they put it at C because of the music. I don't know. Um, that certainly could have been something that they did. In terms of choosing key centers, I sort of have ideas about what the main material that I want to include is going to be from a musical standpoint. Um, then I kind of have made some decisions about what instruments are going to be playing it, or maybe there are some notes about what instruments are going to be playing it. Like maybe I get a note like, hey, we'd like it to sound really military heroic. We'd love to hear some brass here, for example. Um, and then based on those two factors, that's kind of how I choose my key center, because depending on what instrument is going to be playing what specific kind of musical material, I try to kind of place that material in that instrument's sort of sweet spot so that not only does it sound really natural, but also then when you go into the session, bringing idiomatic music that is kind of already sitting in a comfortable place saves you time, sort of like we were talking about earlier with orchestration. That's definitely in the back of my mind as I'm working on something, and that definitely influences where we're going to put the tonic. So my last question is also specifically Halo related. Uh, I noticed when Chief overturns his hand and looks at the empty Cortana chip in Discover Hope, uh, you use chromatic median, it's like G minor to E minor. Uh, I'm just curious if that had anything to do with previous chromatic median relationships uh, in other Halo music in reference to Cortana specifically. Like, does she, is she represented instead of by a theme by that kind of harmonic relationship? It's just a nerdy question. So it's been a while since I worked on Discover Hope, but I want to say that our internal sort of name for that, those that that chromatic mediant idea that is used all over Halo, uh, were the Cortana Mystery Chords. Which is to say, you're on exactly the right track. That's exactly what we were going for. Marty O'Donnell has talked about, I believe in one of his like process videos, those awesome process videos he puts up, um, that he doesn't necessarily do character leitmotifs or themes, but if he were to, I feel like that one definitely seems like it comes up a lot with Cortana, and so it seemed to fit really, really well right there. And I'll, I'll be honest, this was a direction note that I got from the 343 team. They were like, we want this exact thing here. We need to make sure that we're putting this musical reference in here. And, you know, they're right. It works so well. Those two chords are so evocative. Um, we use them there with the chip, and then we use them later um, when we make the direct reference to Luck from Halo 3, another Cortana moment, um, with the, you know, the winds up high doing the sort of staccato chord outline. Um, they're, the two chords that they're outlining are, again, those two chords. So it's just one of these places where we had a, a chance to really kind of dig deep right to to do a deep cut musically and so we definitely took it and uh, exploited it for all it was worth emotionally and finally i'd like to thank you for coming on very much this was super cool and i hope we get to do this again in the future hopefully as we uh, approach the release of the game and certainly after the game is out i'll have a lot more to ask you but until then hope you're well and thanks again my pleasure Once again, I'd just like to thank Curtis for coming on. His insight was super valuable both outside of and within the scope of Halo. One thing that was pretty satisfying was his confirmation that indeed Cortana has a defined musical presence, and that it is in particular those two chords I talked about in one of the breakdowns. Uh, and another thing that I like to do is dig up the names which aren't necessarily surface level, like for instance Tim Davies. To reiterate what Curtis said, it's likely, if not definite, that everything you're hearing in Infinite's music was touched by Mr. Davies, being the orchestrator. I had a great time and learned a lot talking with Curtis, and can't wait to do it again. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. I'm Noah, and this is Traveling Halo. Cortana Mystery Chords